Hello and welcome to the Commonweal Policy Podcast. I'm Craig DL. I'm the Head of Policy and Research at Commonweal. And this week, my guest is Commonweal's Head of Strategic Development, Robin McAlpine. Hello, Robin. How are you? Hi, Craig. Long time no see. I haven't seen you since yes. so 10 minutes ago. <laughs> now, you're not a stranger to the podcast, but I do believe this is the first time you've been on the podcast along with me. Yeah, um, I've, the, the times I've done it before uh, was when you were away on holiday. And I was only filling in. So, yes, this is our first double act. Um, Yeah, so really good to talk to you. Really good to have you here. Now, this week we're going to be talking about the the week that was. We're going to be talking about COP26 and everything we saw there. And uh, um, Because Commonville was actually an an official observer for for COP. We managed to wrangle that one somehow. (laughs) I'm still not entirely sure which strings were pulled where to make that happen. But we managed to, to get that status. And Robin, you did a bit of official observing. You went into the, the conference for a day, had a look around. Can you just take us through what you saw there and your impressions from that day? Well, I mean, I can't really separate my impressions from the day from my expectations of what I, I thought I was going to see and from um, what was what came out the other end. Mm-hmm. And... What I saw was a lot of enthusiastic people really hoping to make something happen, set inside what looked largely like a big corporate expo. So very heavily with corporate sponsorship, and very heavy with the kind of that sense of the branding of, of it being, you know, big money players who were who were there with a lot of it. Now I should emphasize that um, I, I wrote in this in the newsletter a couple of weeks ago. The, I was there very briefly. I was there for, you know, less than a full day. And there was a wee hitch with our tickets. And so it was all, there was, you know, it, was, it was an absolute harem scarum visit. So I got to jog around and not much more. And at the heart of it, it's supposed to be the, at the heart of it, it's supposed to be the, um, the, the talks, the discussion, the conversation yeah. that takes place um, during the COP, which is the key, and I didn't have time to stay in for any of those. Um, so that I couldn't really j- judge. But what my feeling about it was, was that the gap between the expectations of those doing the negotiating and everybody else, I mean, it felt large. felt large being outside where the protesters were. Yeah, I mean, uh, I... I, I... I wasn't that surprised when you came back and you said that the, especially the green zone felt like a corporate expo because I, at the same time as that was happening, I was seeing news reports of um, of the oil and gas sector having a larger delegation than some countries at, at COP. So uh, it really did kind of look from the outside as if there were a lot of companies there trying to convince you how green they were without really saying what they were doing. Yeah, I mean, I think that but I think you could probably, maybe roughly, in the green zone, where I actually went first, um, I think you could have probably just about got the footprint of all the NGO stalls inside the footprint of, say, Hellman's mayonnaise stall. So that gives you a kind of idea. There was a, the Hel- whatever the food group that does Hellman's, they had, a, they had a, an area. Um, and honestly, if you were just taking the absolute footprint of the two, I think you could have fitted all of them in into that space. So it, it, the ba- the balance wasn't didn't feel right when you were there. I mean, it felt. I think I said that I, I wrote this. It felt like you 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 went to it believing that it was the last chance saloon, and you got there, and it was more like the the executive lounge of an airport in terms mm. of feel. Yeah, and that was that. I saw that exact language come from a few other commentators as well. Um, from from any of the folk that you managed to speak to, I know you weren't there that long or, or didn't get into the, the the core of it. But what kind of language were folk using? Was it the kind of language of folk who understood just exactly how serious the climate emergency was, or are we are we still trying to convince people of what the argument is before we try to convince them of what the agreement should be? Well, I mean, again, remember the difference between me talking to people who were there and me talking to negotiators. Yeah. So the people that I bumped and people I talked to, they were, they were really coming from the, absurd, the NGO sector or the trade union sector or the academic sector. They're in no doubt. But, I mean, we had this conversation when I came back. 
there are conversations going on at COP where I found myself saying, we can't still be discussing that, are we? I mean, we can't really, at this point, this far into the game, still be talking about these particular issues and first principles. And I realised that we, we were. So let me just give you one example of something which I was amazed where we were with it. I'm really genuinely amazed from what I saw, from what I saw in the programme, from what I heard. The question of consumption mm. was, it was, seemed to be absent. There was, I saw in my day there, one mention to consumption that said sustainable consumption. And that was from a supermarket. And the rest of it seemed to be underpinned from the concept that we will be consuming the same things in the same way into the future, but it'll be mo with more recycling and made with renewable energy. And it just that just screams out at me, the conversation is a long, long way to go before it catches up with where it should be with reality. Yeah, I mean, this is conversations again I've had with um, with folk like Zero Waste Scotland and um, think folk like the, the, the Wellbeing Economics Alliance who are really kind of pushing back against language coming out of governments that who are still very much growth based whenever they're looking at the, their, their economy. We, 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 we're still going to have that perpetually and ever accelerating growth in our economy, but now we'll do it greener or more sustainable or more inclusive. Um, I, I think there's still a big gap there between what that language is and you know, where we need to be to, to actually sort the climate emergency. It feels a bit like um, that slightly silly, I mean, it became a, a butt of comedian jokes, that way that in London in the 1990s, everybody's tried to find um, adjectives which would make pokey tiny little flat at very high price sound like but compact and bijou, or <laughs> um, comfortably and human sized, or so it was like it was the application of of spurious adjectives to what was something that was clearly substandard, and yeah, that's absolutely right. The um, <laughs> the, the the majority of the recycling so far has been of language, so we've recycled <laughs> these concepts of uh, sustainability of. Um, you know, of, of eco generally, of uh, well-being, all of these catchwords, all these phrases are now being applied to patterns of what we were basically doing anyway. And, you know, this is the, the stage that we've reached. The period of climate denial has gone, but the, 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 the period of denial about what climate science is telling us mm. it's still very much um where we are there's still this idea that we'll find rare earth minerals somehow from somewhere and it'll all be fine as long as we are um digging them up with some form of renewable energy at some point in the unspecified future it's all daft yeah that or uh, I remember a recent uh, um, recent article from Ed Miliband talking about the, the danger of the climate delay or the people who are saying, okay, we need to be decarbonized by some future date that is well beyond any kind of reasonable electoral horizon, which basically means we don't need to do anything right now, but we will do it tomorrow or sometime after that. Well, you see, the funny thing is that, again, I think you know this because we, we talked about it. We were talking about climate delay being the new climate denial about three years ago. My problem is that I think we're now that we've gone beyond that. So the even the ones who are not deny even sorry, the ones who are not denying, um, even the ones who, who are not delaying are still in denial. It's still a denial. So for example, most people would say that Scotland isn't delaying. To which I say, yeah, but that's only because we're in denial. We've set targets. And it's like um it's a fairy godmother thing. So we will we will have success. We will successfully meet strenuous targets through. Blah, 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 blah. So, sorry, what yes. was that? I didn't catch it. No, through the power of. Blah, 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 blah. No, no. Please take your hand away from your mouth and say it using words quite clearly. How are you going to do this? Carbon cap. Blah, 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 blah. Sorry, you yeah. broke up again. And that's kind of where we are just now. So it's not even it's not even obviously delay in the sense that. 
even within nations which have accepted this is both real and urgent, you've still got a construction of the you've got the construction of the idea that something will come along or it will be okay or the market will sort this out. And that's where we are now. It, it's, it's gone even beyond climate delay into a kind of, it's almost like a, a, a climate coma. We, you mm. know, our, our, our vital organs are still functioning, but our brains don't seem to be operating in terms of where we are now. We're just stuck. I, I, that, I'm, I'm, I'd be lying if I didn't see this is all leaving me a bit de depressed, a bit dis in despair. I mean, it's that thing whereby the summer we just had with the floods and the, and the wildfires and, and the, the, the extremes of weather temperature. Um, it's almost like that nudged us out of delay into another zone. But this new zone is just another rung up the ladder of not getting it done. We can't afford to be there. You know, the next shock that sets us up the next rung of the ladder could be a real stinker. And when I say that, I'm probably using the long language because I mean, it could be devastating. Yeah. So if I was going to take a guess, the next the next ratchet up of this is going to be a food crisis. There's going to be uh, some form of prolonged weather event somewhere in the world that wipes out enough crops that creates a spiral of panic buying in, in international food markets and so on, which is going to result in major it could be major famine it could be sharp price rises and, and social unrest in the west um i mean and if you think that this is all sounding a bit doomy i mean what i'm really describing is what happened 10 years ago in syria i mean that's that's the at the heart of the syrian war one of its key drivers was mass internal migration because of uh weather events the collapse of domestic crops and because of sharply rising prices because of a range of unconnected events that happened in particularly in the, the market the global market for rice and other and other staples that that is used in syria and that is that has driven things there but for us we can just see it as a civil war or, or, you know an extension of middle east nonsense one day that's going to come to us and i think the summer when you can't get food because of a weather event a series of weather events it may take that to ratchet us so one further step up the ladder. But the problem is, by the time that step comes, there's no going back. Yeah. You can't have a, an extreme weather event. You know, it's, it's, that's, that's, it's for life, no for Christmas. So once we've reached the point at which these extreme weather events have motivated us to do something, they're never going away again. Yeah, in fact, I was reading an article this morning on, on Bloomberg, um, I'll stick a link in, to it in, in the description of the podcast, um, about a series of droughts and weather disruptions in Brazil uh, that have pretty much wiped out a good chunk of the coffee harvest there this year. Uh, well, Steve, that's, that's, that's the sort of thing. That'll, say, there's, there, that'll create a revolution in the West. Yep. You can't get a coffee. Then yep. suddenly it'll be, this will suddenly be something of great urgency. Well, we're in the way of it here. I can't get a coffee. We'll need to do something about climate change. I don't care what it is. I just wish to hell it would hurry up because we're needing another jolt. It would appear. Yeah, in fact, this article was saying that it goes. It does go beyond coffee, and it was framing Brazil as the producer of the world's breakfasts because they produce uh, a lot of cereal crops. They produce mm -hmm. um, a lot of soy to feed uh, animals. Mm -hmm. They produce a lot of. Uh, uh, a lot of eggs themselves and uh, well, that's more of a, a regional import and they produce a lot of beef although who, who are just having, still having their breakfast steak in the morning I don't know um, but yeah. still it's, 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 it's as serious as that because you, you have that big producer of a range of goods all suffering the same climate event in that, in that region that could as you say could have knock on effects on multiple supply chains that's a mild climate event I mean, that's just yeah. that's just run of the mill bog standard um bad weather conditions for crops that we're not yet talking about entire regions getting wiped out by floods or, or summers of extreme heat and drought um never mind and this is the thing that again it's people still simplify the climate um and that's a mistake or simultaneously we could have two major food region, regions, one's wiped out by flood at the same time that another one's being wiped out by drought. 
So you can have multiple different weather events coinciding in different parts of the globe, but the outcome of it is the same. We will see major disruption to our ecosystem and our ecosystem is what produces our food. Yeah. That, that's, that's the, I mean, that's my guess of what it's going to take to get the West to step another step up the, the ladder. And then at that point, the question will be, does that finally push us to climate action? Or does that f push us to buy more guns? Because there, it's not an unrealistic possibility that we get into a frame which says, oh, well, it's all screwed. There's no more we can do. Global resources are going to be limited in the future. Our most important response to them is then to make sure that we can get our share. And in that case, if, that, if, if we end up in that frame in the developed West, then I genuinely fear for the future of humanity. Yeah, you could easily end up in that walled garden scenario. We we put up the walls and the barriers and we're okay inside it because we could afford to put up the walls and the barriers. We well, see the problem is that the globalized world means that they can't they, these cannot exactly. be well for most, these cannot be impervious walls because they can't eat. Yeah, you know, this is the this is the point. <clears throat> and it and, and it could be worse than putting up the walls. In some ways it would actually be quite in some ways it was actually quite good for the world if everyone put up metaphorical worlds and became more self-sufficient because in that case they would be responsible for producing their own food and all those geopolitical impacts that we've been seeing of climate crisis and and, and war for resources would, would, would subside the problem is that um the first thing that you've got to do is secure the food so my fear is it's not walls that they build but um you know battleships that, that's the that's the, the bigger fear, which is that the Western world is n now so reliant, so reliant on the global south and 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 you know the 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 the, the, the far east for us for so much of our quality of life, our, our standard of life, the things that we assume to be real, that we can't put up a wall. And if you know, if if, if international trading markets start saying you know what, we're not going to sell you our food because we're kind of short ourselves. What do we do? I mean, do we turn up with a gunship and say we're taking it? I mean, that, that's, that's a very doomy scenario. But we created an interconnected world which could very well end up without an, uh, you know, without an interconnected, stable climate. Yeah. And that's going to be a, a, a worrying thought. Yeah. I mean that's that's the way the world was run for a couple of centuries. It was uh, that's how that's how uh, mercantile multinational empires work. Is you find out who has stuff that you that you want and you go and take it. And we believe that we have reached a level of civilization which makes that impossible. Yeah. And I think we all now know how quickly that level of civilization will decline. So. To understand how we go from being calm, sensible, civilized, rational humans to being irrational, uh, destructive forces overnight, just look at a run in the supermarket with COVID. Yes. You know, if you look at folk wrestling each other and shoving and pushing to get the last roll of toilet paper, and then just say, then, yeah, and now that's what it could look like in the world stage, but with guns. And, you know, with, with um, giant uh, ships filled with grain. And this is a real risk. Now, I don't want to be permanently gloomy here. There's plenty opportunity for the world to pull back from that future. But this is kind of what I'm saying about the ratcheting, the step by step. Um, we've managed to take a step up from the, 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 the sphere of climate denial in a lot of countries. I guess what I'm going to call it is we've reached climate delusion. Mm. We know we need to act, and we know we need to act now, but we're being delusional about what acting looks like. And did you see that in the the, the agreement from that came out of COP itself? Because I think I certainly did. Uh, you see, you seen people sort of saying, kind of putting as positive a spin on it as they can by saying, right, sure. The promises only lead us to a plus 2.4 degree world if the, all the promises are fully implemented, which is still breaching the absolute maximum ceiling that we can go to. But that's better than the four degrees that we were looking at before the agreement. And is that enough? I mean, are we even still on the pathway to enough? 
with, with no, agreements no, like not this. Close, not nearly, not in a, by a million miles. I've just been written by it. I'm just, I've just been I've just been writing something and used this metaphor, which is what's the correct speed to head for a fire exit in the event of an inferno? Is going at half a mile an hour better than not moving? Well, not if the if the inferno is going is, is shifting at the state of five meters a second across a room, you know, half a mile an hour is just the difference between getting fried up now and getting fried up in 10 minutes. It, it, it doesn't save you. It doesn't mm. actually help. And it's one of these, it's just one of these human fallacies that slightly better is better than nothing. Or let me give you another analogy. I mean, the physics says that if you talk, fall off the top of a skyscraper, the physics suggests that flapping your arms is slightly better than doing nothing. But, I mean... But not enough of, of well, anything. Yeah. Negotiate that with the pavement. Yeah. Because it, 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 it's, it's not enough. So 2.4, I mean, the chances of a human surviving is always there. You know, a five degree rise somehow by living in the North Pole or some god-awful uh, approach, you know, there's a chance of a human surviving. But my guess is that 2.4%, the chance of civilization as we know it, prolonging itself into the future, it seems to me to be questionable. And I say that partly because the predictions are really desperately bad for that circumstance. Yes. And there's a thing that I keep coming back to those. See, so far, there ain't been any prediction that didn't turn out to be worse than it appeared to be in advance. We, climate scientists keep getting surprised that it all keeps turning out to be worse than they thought it was going to be. And that's my fear. 2.4 looks terrible in its current assessment. But, and again, you and I are quite geek about this, but we, we, we use the term quite a bit. Non-linear. It is not linear. Two point, you know, at some point you reach what, you know, we call them tipping points because yeah. the the amount of motion, travel that it takes to go over the top of the tipping point can be tiny, but the impact of it can be enormous. Yeah. You know, you, you, you're over the edge. The, the step that takes you off the top of that tower block is a tiny step, but the impact of it is enormous. And I mean, the one I keep pointing out for Scotland, which is, you know, sitting around saying, congratulations, we kept it to 2.3. It wasn't as bad as we thought. You know what that counts for if the Gulf Stream reverses? Counts for nothing, is it? It's kind of like we can applaud ourselves through three pairs of mittens because we're in an ice age. Yeah. And that's the fear. That's the problem. That's the, that's the difficulty with all of this, which is humans are nothing like as clever as we think we are. We think we can envisage what this looks like. We think we can map and model and understand what will happen. And we will be wrong. Whatever we think is going to happen will not quite be what happens. And my guess is that what happens is not going to be better than we think. Yeah, I mean, I, I do like sort of pointing out that Scotland is not immune to all of us. Well, like is the wrong word, obviously. Um, especially when I'm talking to politicians. I've, I've found three uh, Scottish politicians so far whose own constituency office is scheduled to go underwater at or before yeah. two degrees C. But, but here's the key thing. I wonder, because I really think this is a, a, a key question here. Everybody knows this. Does Do people really believe it? Yeah. Do people in their fundamental heart of hearts see pictures of St Andrews underwater and believe that's a thing that will happen? And the answer is, I think it isn't. Even I keep thinking to myself, somehow that'll be averted. Somehow it won't quite go like that. Something will turn up. Something will come along. And I know that right now, there's no sign of that thing coming along. Therefore, the sign says St. Andrews is going to be the new Atlantis. Yeah. Um, but I struggle to believe it, even though I know it. And this is, that's the problem. I, you, you cannot envisage St. Andrews under the water. And yeah. by the yeah. time it happens, the time it happens, I mean, again, this is another thing. I think, unless I'm mistaken, that it's not going to be a centimetre 
you know, the, the sea rate won't rise a centimetre a year so that, you know, with time to go, we can actually see the effect of it. And we'll suddenly go, ah, oh, wait a minute, that is rising, we better do something now. I suspect what you'll find is there'll be some moment when there's a major rebalancing of seas and you get sudden rises in, in, in water. And, you know, we're not equipped... Our, our brains are not equipped for understanding the complexity of what's ahead, and we, yeah. and without that, we probably think there might be a simple fix way to do it. Do you think that that inability to see these things is a is a reason why COP has failed, and and is that oh. a fundamental weakness with the the kind of approach we're taking of global multilateral agreement, trying to get the entire world to agree and action all at once? Well. Take, take both of these questions is the problem at COP that people can't envisage this future? Not really not really the problem at COP is that Western democracy is fundamentally broken it's supposed to follow the interests of the citizen but it doesn't, it's heavily influenced by I mean, it's mainly it's by the big vested interests of corporations so the corporations are right the, 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 the COP gives you just as much climate action as the corporations will allow. That's the barrier. It's not, it's not, it's not fundamentally, it's not a problem of human cognition. We might not fully believe it, but the people in COP believe it enough, en enough to be negotiating seriously, but they all behave, they, they all behave as if it's normal that the limits of that discussion are set outside of democracy. So the, the limits of that discussion are seen to be set by financial interests, not by the will of democracy. So we've got all the climate action that Shell will permit. That's really what we're seeing here. So is this going to work? Well, again, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'd like to say I've got a good experience of multilateralism, but I mean, I've been watching for quite a long time since my childhood now because I came from the peace movement. Yeah. So how how does how's multilateralism gone in terms of disarming nuclear weapons? Why do we think it's going to be any different with climate change? Now the, the answer to that might be that, okay, there's a deadline. So there's a deadline which says that um, we need to act, we need to act, but we're not. The deadline's here and we're not acting. So the problem with multilateralism is, I think, twofold. First of all, it identifies the wrong problem. And then second of all, it creates the wrong solution. So the wrong problem is that I, this idea that climate change is global. Now, I get really irritated with this. The impacts of climate change are global, but the causes of climate change are phenomenally local. They come out of your exhaust pipe. They leak out of the roof of your house. They come out of coal-fired or gas-fired power stations. They are, you know, they, you can track and trace the causes of climate change to centimeters. You know, you really can. And all of these things happen within the um, all of these things happen within the within the remit of the nation state. So these aren't things which are outside the power of the nation state. Um, these are all within the power of the nation state. So it's a local, it's a global impact caused by a bunch of local actions. And the local actions are governed at the nation state level, not the international mm -hmm. level. So what we've done is we've tried to make this multinational, multilateral for a very good reason, which is we can all hide behind each other. So what we've said is we are doing all this harm but to stop that harm, we can't go at a pace faster than everyone else goes. So we'll hide behind everybody else. So multilateralism is a way of slowing down action, not accelerating it. And I don't think it works because, um, like I say, the problem isn't global. The problem is local. And the solution isn't global. The solution is local. When you don't insulate houses at a global level, you don't um, put car in for charging infrastructure. Electric carrying. That's not a global task. These are all local tasks. So the solution, the, the, the impacts are global, 
but the causes are local and the solutions are local. Now, I understand that we need somehow to put pressure on states which aren't moving fast enough. And in theory, that's what COP does. But in practice, what COP does really is to slow down the pace of change in states which would go further. So it is a process of working its way down to a lowest common denominator. And I think the problem is too big for that. I think it's too important for that. I think we're in too much trouble for that. So my view is I think we've got to hit a situation of coalition of the willing. The countries that can and want to make rapid change have to make the rapid change. And rather than hanging about hoping that others will catch up, I genuinely think we need to get into a system of BDS. I think that boycott, divestment and sanctions in countries which are not doing the right thing may be the way we've got to go. So you've got to get global coalitions of countries who are willing to change and who make the steps to change and then they collectively may have to impose pressure, any political pressure they can, on countries that aren't moving fast enough. Um, I'll, I'll, if we maybe get time, I don't know, to, to discuss the global south and the problems of countries which don't have the capacity to change in the way that mm. the, the West does. But the concept that um, it's up to us to do what we should be doing ourselves now, and then it's our responsibility to drag others behind us as best as we can using whatever tools we've got, strikes me as being a more realistic route out of this than continuing to turn up year after year and moving at the pace of the slowest mover. And that's what we're doing at the moment. And it, it's left me, it has left me a bit despondent in the wake of COP to see that reality play out in front of us where we are. You know, we, you, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was helpful, I think, for us to be able to see properly the draft agreement and the final agreement to see yes. what was taken out. And we know what was taken out. We know why it was taken out. All the climate action shell will permit. You know, Exxon will permit. It's, 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 it's big. The boundaries of the possibility are being set by vested interests. Yeah, and even, even some of the, the, the language we've seen in countries, you, you talked about this earlier, about constantly phasing down the, the language of climate change um, to, to, to phrases like net zero, which to, to countries that are disproportionately the cause of the climate emergency, us, the global north, the west, net zero just says, right, we, there's going to be a date where we stop making things worse. We haven't promised to make things better. Yeah, no, that date's 30 years from now, it's mental. Yeah. So, um, it, but, it, but it's not just that. The big thing is that... <laughs> Civilization will fall through the holes in the net. That's the point. This is this this net is a con job. Every the, the big buzzword it seemed to me around about COP, and I'm really sad to say it is now flooding policy in Scotland too, is the world word mitigation. So rather than stopping, we are going to mitigate, do something else to to undo the harm that our actions are doing. And I'm going to shrug and say, uh, really? We think we can do the bad thing and then mop it up somehow through something else and believe that that's true. So what, I mean, again, it's just, it's, it's one of those, we know this, we know so much about this. We know that current mitigation, carbon offset, that they're not, they don't deliver a fraction of as much mitigation as they pretend. They are the definition of greenwashing. So emitting the same amount of carbon and mitigating it is the current plan. That's the net. And like I say, our lives will slip through the holes in that net, yeah. and those holes are vast. So net zero ain't enough. It's got to be zero, zero. It's the only sane way we go is to get to zero, zero. But that's not in anybody's agenda right now, which is really tough to hear yeah not even scotland um as you as you say um but where does scotland go from here we've just hosted this that we've got an inadequate agreement we've also while we've seen more and more greenish policies come out of the government again they're not enough in themselves what should scotland be doing right now 
Oh, well, I mean, obviously, you know, we've designed the whole bloody process for what Scotland should actually do, called the Common Home Plan, which is what Scotland should actually do. So let me pick, let me pick that answer apart in two ways. First of all, um, what is Scotland doing? What is Scotland likely to do? You said there was a flurry of green policies, but you see, I've been spending a bit of time just digging into them. Hmm. And I mean, for the most part, these look like the definition of the least you could possibly do to generate a headline. So, um, I mean, the one that, I, that stuck out to me was there's a press release uh, last week saying there was going to be this fund to help community-led climate action. And it was distributed, I can't remember, about 14 towns in Scotland. Right, the average funding per town is £20,000. But so that's not an admin post. How much, how much can a community do in climate action for £20,000? Yeah. Next to nothing. So what does it do? Oh, I don't know. I think the intention is it holds a series of discussion groups and prints up a, a report. And that'll take all 20 grand. Well, okay, but I mean, it's late in the day, I would suggest for a series of funded discussion groups with a print publication at the end of it. So that's, I mean, I, again, really sadly, I could do that for almost everything that came out in the last two weeks, which had a headline in our press release, which was green. Um, there, it's, it's too little. But this is, well, here's a bit of optimism in, among what's been a fairly gloomy picture for me. Um, I was talking to an economist, I was a London-based economist, and we were chatting, uh, and it was something else completely, and it got on the subject of climate change, and it, it just kind of revealed to me that he'd actually sat down and done a spreadsheet of where probably should he start to uh, migrate towards if he wishes to survive the climate crisis. And Scotland was, was a definite top three. Um, you know, right up there with New Zealand and, and Iceland as places where you might want to go uh, in the event of climate change because we've got so much space, we've got so much energy, we've got so many resources, we've got so the capacity to produce so many calories of food, and we've got such a low density of population. And frankly, uh, the coasts notwithstanding, we're pretty high sitting ground. So there's going to be plenty of Scotland left when the when the sea does come in. We are potentially the world's luckiest nation. We are incredibly well equipped and well endowed to take on climate change, which makes the 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 really minimalistic things that we are doing at the moment to tackle it almost more shaming. So it's that thing which is, you know, if if you've got a uh, if you've got to empty heavy boxes out the back of a lorry then you kind of expect the large growing man to carry more than the eight-year-old children just because they're physically better equipped to do it. And right now in Scotland, we are looking over and just saying, look, look, just take one more box than the eight-year-olds. Then we can say we're better. And it's wrong. It's not right. Um, so that's what, what the Scottish government should do. Scottish government should stop claiming to be world leading and stop trying to back that up through the setting of targets it keep, keep misses, keeps missing. The Scottish government should actually start to do some things that lead the world in action. It's that simple. Don't talk about being world leading. Lead the world. We are so, so far away from leading the world. And if anybody is listening and they say, ah, but Robin, look at the stats of renewable energy. That's nothing we did. That's just an impact of the fact that we've got bucket loads of this free energy blowing over the top of our land. You have to be flat out daft not to put wind turbines up in Scotland. It's not something we did. It's something we were given. Mm. Anybody with what we were given would have done at least what's happened here, which was license wind farms and let people make money out of it. So to claim that our, our proportions of energy generated from renewable energy shows that we are leading, no, it shows that we're lucky. If we had twice it, three times it, with energy storage 
in a coordinated grid and we'd built an economy round about this clean energy, doing all sorts of industrial processes based on this voluminous amount of clean energy we've got, then we'd be leading the world. But congratulations, Scotland, it's windy. Is not an act of, it's not a, an action on our part. It is a function of the place we live. As the humans who live here, we should be doing so, so much more than this. And the idea that we're sitting lecturing a mega city in China, which has real problems potentially getting off coal and getting onto clean fuel. The idea that we're lecturing them, tapping our feet, saying, where are you guys? Why aren't you catching us up? I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a deep moral, there's something deeply morally suspicious about that. We've got everything and we're doing very little with it. And some have got very little and are doing very little with it. And we think that that's comparable. We think that, you know, we're doing no worse than them, but that's not right. We are doing worse than them because it's so much easier for us to do the right thing. So Scotland, yeah. you want to ask me, yeah, what should we do? We should do this now. We should do a, a, a Green New Deal. We should do the Common Home Plan. We should target reaching zero, zero. Net positive in 25 years. It can be done. Net positive in 25 years. We should do it with absolute gusto. We should expect to say to the world, look, this can be done. And hopefully we'll drag a few more people with us. So more nation states will say, actually, you know something, we should be doing that too. And they can join us. And then maybe if enough of us join, we can create a coalition. And maybe then we can start creating and increasing trade links between those who are doing things in the right way, buying goods and services from each other, which we know are morally defensible in a world on fire. And then once we've got that coalition, maybe we should start to boycott the countries which haven't done the things they should have done. We should stop buying their goods. We should stop engaging with them. Uh, fully um we should certainly stop investing in them until they start to show the kind of necessary will to act that the world needs i i don't want to present our future as one which is effectively a kind of form of global conflict um it would be brilliant if i believed that we could negotiate a collective way out of this now but we keep failing so we're going to have to do something or we're going to have to live with the consequences. And the consequences are horrible, or at least they are very potentially horrible. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that that vision there, that is ultimately the optimistic vision that we can do. This is a vision of what enough looks like. So I think that vision there is a really good place to, to finish up the podcast on. Thank you, Robin, for joining us. That's been a great chat. Um, and I'd just like to remind all the listeners out there, as I always do, Commonweal is completely funded by by you, by our supporters who, who give us an average of £10 a month uh, or buy uh, merchandise from our shop. And we do have a Christmas shop opening up very, very soon. We'll be talking about that uh, a bit more in the, the, the coming days and a couple of weeks. I should say there will be no podcast next week as I'm away on holiday, but... I will see you all in December when we round up the, the, the year with some, some more interesting policies from in and around Scotland. And I'll see you all then.